Thanks for having me. So, um, Ned got in contact with me and he said that they'd really like to hear about my time in, in LA and Berlin. So, um, it sort of forced me to go through my archives, which has been quite enjoyable actually. Sort of looking back at that time, because it was actually 20 years ago. So, um, anyway, uh, so I studied at RMIT. And um, at the end of my third year, I felt I wanted to change. And so I went and spoke to the head of the school at the time, Leon Van Schaik. So Leon was head of the school at the time. He was from the Architecture Association and he had a huge influence on, on RMIT at the time in the 90s. Um, and I said, look, I'd really like to study overseas. And he recommended that I apply at SciArc, which is in Los Angeles. Um, which was a very exciting school at the time and um, had all the, the big names teaching there when I was a student, which was pretty exciting to me. So some names may be familiar to you, Eric Owen Moss, um, Tom Main from Morphosis, uh, Wolf Pree from Co-op Himmenblau, like they were all the exciting architects of the time. So I sent over a folio. Hi, Des. <laughs> was um, accepted and was the foundation exchange student at SciArc. So I think there's still an exchange happening between RMIT and SciArc. So I was the first one to set that up. So that was pretty exciting. So I arrived in, in Venice. Um, that's my little collage because I took it with a manual camera and we'd stick our photos together. So that's me standing on Venice Beach. It was... Um, a pretty amazing city to arrive in, in Los Angeles. So to give you a bit of context about what was happening in America at the time, I arrived in 1994. Bill Clinton was in power. There were this, uh, the um, South Central riots had happened in 1992. So there was still a bit of that vibe in the streets of Los Angeles. I think it's a very different city today, but when I arrived, um, there was still a fair bit of racial tension. So for a young middle-class Melbourneite, that was that was a pretty confronting and exciting thing to sort of experience. These are the architects who were uh, the happening thing in the 90s, and they were teaching at SIARC at the time. So. Frank Geary, Eric Owen Moss, that's one of Tom Main from Morphosis' drawings. And that's Hodgett Sing Fung, fantastic temporary library that was built at um, UCLA. So back in Melbourne, these architects were very much influenced by what they were doing in America. So it was very exciting for me as a young student to be going to a school where I had, a, had the opportunity to actually be taught by these these women and men. A week after arriving in LA there was an earthquake so it was 6.7 on the Richter scale and it basically, I mean whole freeways collapsed um, and I hadn't found anywhere to live at that point and there were no mobile phones in those days or emails so my parents had no way of contacting me to find out if I was so they contacted the Australian consulate and tracked me down. And I arrived at school on the Monday and the, the head of international studies just ran up to me and said, call your parents. And so it was um, pretty amazing. And actually a lot of the discussion in the city about the impact of this earthquake was its actual bonding effects, which was interesting that it actually brought people together. So that was... Another interesting thing to be experiencing in the city. I lived in Venice and that was my car. So I had the opportunity to buy a really cheap 1967 Chevy Malibu from South Central from a Mexican family. And it felt pretty strange going into this African-American neighbourhood as a white girl to buy this car. Um, I think my naivety protected me. So um, 
Kasayak at the time was in Marina del Rey. It's now located in downtown LA. But um, that's another interesting thing about Los Angeles at the time is that um, the downtown was predominantly Latino, African American, and yeah, I mean, I guess it was what happened to Melbourne a long time, like in the 80s. Um, but I think downtown LA is very different today. There's a lot more people living there and it's been regentrified and, and revitalised. But when I lived there in the, in the mid-90s, it was considered a pretty ghettoised, scary place. Um, so this is where I lived in Venice. Um, I'm in the, the lower orange area. So I was about 800 metres from the beach. Um, it was a pretty interesting neighbourhood to live in and another interesting thing about my neighbourhood, it was called Oakwood. So it was one of the few um, African American owned neighbourhoods and so the domestic staff had, had over the years purchased land and the closer you got to the beach, the whiter and more expensive it became which is pretty much similar all over the world. But um, I think that was one thing that I really noticed as a, um, a, tr a visiting international student uh, was that spatial separation, spatial socioeconomic racial separation in the city. And that upper orange... Um, what I've highlighted was there was a really fantastic Frank Gehry building just around the corner from where I lived. Uh, it was BAM Studios and Frank Gehry and it was actually Dennis Hopper's house. And I think it, I mean, Dennis Hopper chose to live in this, this neighbourhood, quite tough neighbourhood, rather than live in Tinseltown. And um, I think Gehry captured that in terms of a sort of contextual response really brilliantly. Some of my favourite projects in them. That lower one on the right is his own house. So I guess in terms of my own work in Melbourne, I relate much more to this early work of Gary's than his current sort of curvy um, titanium stuff because he was dealing with very, well, smaller budgets and very, um, very basic raw materials and really expression structure um, in his early work. So this was my neighbourhood. Um, well, these are some images I took of, of LA and um, the double image down there is of the downtown. So these beautiful old theatres and what was once a very grand part of Los Angeles have basically, basically been abandoned. Some, a lot of these have been taken over by clothing stores and the rag trade, so they were full of, full of people selling material and stuff like that. Um, and it, the other thing which is, was a real challenge to me was how car dependent the city was, um, having come from Melbourne and also as a, a young woman feeling safe in the street and st safe to ride from RMIT at two in the morning back to where I lived in Fitzroy, I, didn't, I could do that and feel okay but that was just a complete no-no in, in Los Angeles. So again it was just reinforcing that idea of public space being quite a threatening, dangerous place, um, not a safe space. And um, I guess that's what inspired my first project when I was there. And I did this with a, an architect called Coy Howard, who I've been told, even though there are all these big names like er Eric Owen Moss and blah, 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 when I arrived they said, look, you really should do a studio with this guy. He's, he's, you'll learn so much. And... Um, and I did, and he actually teaches also at an art school. So he brings in a lot of that experience in the way that he teaches in terms of thinking about materialisation of your projects. So my first project when I was at SciArc, and this is all hand-drawn, guys, like tracing paper and ink, and <laughs> um, was an inner-city library, and it really explored those ideas of, of the public and the private and, and revealing... Um, visually revealing elements but physically being physically unattainable and sort of trying to sort of tease out those things that I was experiencing myself in the city of Los Angeles. Um, 
And I think, yeah, I was very influenced by the stuff that Morphosis was doing with the exploded axonometric, but um, that sort of teases out the elements of the building in terms of um, really trying to think about the idea of episodic spaces and a narrative through the building um, and the idea of private and public. Um, so these are some views. So charcoal drawings. So these are A1. These are really huge drawings. And another great thing about SciArc, I'm not sure what it's like here, but the, um, all of the design studios were at on the campus. So you basically were in a room with your cohort for the whole semester and you had 24-hour access. So you were basically there just producing work. And I think I got into quite a good work ethic coming to the school, being with the other students. And um, it was also the master's program, so there were a lot of mature age students. And <clears throat> um, so this is the outside of the inner city library looking in, sort of, so you could connect with the material and the spaces from the exterior, but not, not, not be allowed to enter, sort of playing with those ideas. Um, another studio I did was with a so social theorist, I guess you'd call him, Mike Davis. Um, this wasn't a design studio, it was a theory class. Um, he'd, he's written quite a few books, one was City of Ports about, about Los Angeles, but his class was set in uh, Vegas and um, he actually took us down there on a field trip and what we were looking at was this this phenomena of, of the trailer park home and um, these transient semi-permanent homes um, and this huge growing underclass in America and I think it's probably going to quadruple beyond belief now that Trump's in power but um, it's it was another confronting part of being in America there's, I believe there's a, a, uh, a third, third world class alive and well in, in America it's um, I mean, we're very lucky in Australia to have social welfare and all these things we take for granted. But um, most, you know, the underclass in America can't even afford dental care or basic medical care. So I think um, Mike Davis was doing a good job of... Because, I mean, to, to, to go to university, you need to be quite privileged in America. It's bloody expensive. And um, I was lucky to be there as an exchange student, <laughs> paying hex back in Australia. Um, but he was doing a good job of trying to, uh, I guess, broaden the students' minds about some of the real issues facing America and how architects might deal with those issues. Um, when I was in LA, Liebskin set up an office in LA. He was teaching at UCLA. Um, so I went and knocked on his door and said, can I work for you? <laughs> and... Um, he said yes. So it was a small office at the time. There were only, I think, seven, seven, I think there were two project leaders and then all pretty much student, student um, uh, cheap labour. And um, so he rented a pretty much a, a deserted building in, in, in LA, which was pretty fantastic, and set up an office there. He only had one built project, um, uh, well, one project under construction in the office at the time back in Berlin, which was a Jewish museum, and that was one through competition. And his office was, was basically a competition's office. So um, all of his work was procured by a competition. Um, so all we worked on was comp competitions, trying to get more work for the office. It was an incredibly intense time. It was um, exciting. I've gained incredible skills and just an amazing opportunity to work so closely with Daniel. Um, so the first competition we worked on was the Bremen Philharmonic and uh, there was a German interior design uh, interior designer working in the office who was only working there because her husband was um, working in LA. He was a Nobel Prize 
something or other. But it, she'd done some training as a carpenter in Germany, so she could build things like musical instruments, which was perfect for this Philharmonic, and I was able to work with her, and we built this amazing site model, um, and that's the final result there. So um, the competition won first prize, but um, the city of Bremen, where the, the where the building was for, couldn't raise the funds, so it, it's never been realised. I mean, it'd be great to see it eventually be realised, but um, uh, when we are in the office, um, Liebskin won another competition, the Nussbaum Museum, so they basically decided to close the LA office and move back to LA, uh, Berlin and they invited me to go with them, so it was a pretty fantastic opportunity, so of course I, I went with them. Um, but I guess the intensity of working in that office was really getting a sense of, of, of Daniel's methodology and understanding how he works. and. Um, you know, he draws inspiration from all over the place. I mean, with this it was music and very much about context and drawing elements into the project, um, almost as a, as a form-generating process. So that was a really, really interesting thing to witness. And then the importance of craft in the projects as well, in terms of the models themselves, uh, to resolve design, like build model upon model upon model, where he could really get a sense of the form and and develop the design and also drawing, which was by this time a combination of computer and hand drawing. So then I moved to the Berlin office. This is some pictures from the Berlin office, um, and yeah, it was it was non-stop. We would just do finish one competition and the next one would start. So this this competition was. Um, was an architecture school on the old Weimar site. So I think I need to also give you context about Berlin at the time. It was um, 95 when I arrived there and so the wall came down in 89 and that process of unification of the East and West was still very much happening. And when I was there, <coughs> um, Potsdamer Platz was basically a construction site and every major star architect name you could think of was building a building in Potsdam Platz. So it was a plus uh, the Jewish Museum was under construction and, and Daniel was just trying to procure more built work through the competitions office. So basically there was the, the Jewish Museum comp um, project team and then the competitions office and that's how the office was, was basically set up. Um, we did a lot of late hours. Um, I remember taking my sleeping bag a few times and just sleeping there because it was easier. Um, I mean, I was 24, so I think, you know, I was willing to do that. I don't think I'd do that to my own staff these days, but anyway. It did pr produce some, some incredible work and he did win a lot of competitions at this, in this period in the 90s. Um, so, I mean, that just gives you a bit of an idea of the team. I was actually going to go on that team at the moment. It's a bit perfect. But, um, yeah, a lot of model building, a lot of drawing, all part of the design process. And um, Daniel had come in and spend about an hour with us a day, and that was it, and then just leave us, leave us to it to basically produce the work. Um, and that was the proposal for the Weimar competition. Um, I think he got a commendation for this one, so he didn't get a project out of that. Um, and another competition that he won while I was in the office was a B&A um, extension, but that's never been realised either. I think that was another funding and major issue with um, heritage. I think they found it too outlandish. Um, yeah, so it was, it was an exciting, intense time, and but it was time for me after having been away now for three years, and I st I had to come home and finish my degree basically. Oh, and that was a nice message from Daniel. So um, one of his the earlier project I showed you, the Bremen exhibition. There's this fantastic gallery in um in Berlin called 
gallery hiatus and it's basically a um, it's a it's a architecture gallery it's it only exhibits architecture work which I must say when I was on council with the Institute I said you should reserve one of the build one of the rooms in this new building on exhibition Street as a as a gallery like a that could rotate you know architects work um, so back to Melbourne back to finishing my thesis look I've just put these these in these drawings because I came back being able to draw like a laser printer and even though everyone was doing computer generated stuff it just didn't make sense for me to suddenly try and take that take that on so I did my thesis all hand drawn um, there's just a couple of drawings from that um, Corrigan okay so <laughs> Um, he was one of my tutors at RMIT and um, look it was a fantastic studio in terms of the way he ran it um, and what he exposed us to as students. Uh, when I ran a studio with him he was working closely with Barry Kosky who is a, um, a director and a, a, a theatre group called the Gilgud Theatre, and they were doing a they were doing the Dibb book. So as a class, he Corrigan would basically take us all to help paint sets and build sets, and then we got to sit in on rehearsals and yeah, see them rehearse, and then get to go to some of the shows, and um, that was a brilliant thing to see in terms of Corrigan's involvement in the actual set design and the costume design and, and how immersed he became in that. And then back in the, in the, in the actual design studio, um, you know, we'd, some of the tasks were to design a staircase to a piece of music and um, really challenging us to think about space and architecture in a different way and draw on art, music, theatre, literature as, as a means of inspiration. Um, then um, there was the opportunity to work with him on the Federation Square competition and um, that was with a few other colleagues of mine and again yeah it was it was good to see his process and I think this was an interesting scheme actually it had um, a series of gardens and indigenous gardens um, and uh, but yeah we know who won and what's been built so it's sort of it was a real privilege to have to have been able to work with Peter and also be one of his students I've, I've got very fond memories and I think I, it's it's had a um, an ongoing influence in terms of the way I approach my own work and um, So my own work. So look, being in comp involved in competitions um, is still something important that I believe is important to my practice. Um, I think I wish there was more of a culture of competitions in Australia in terms of work being procured and I think it's really disappointing that competitions like Flinders Street Station, you know, the process has occurred, someone's been told they've won and yet we're never seeing, seeing it being built and I think that's that's not great for our profession and you know I think you can get great results out of out of competitions as a means of procuring work. This was my proposal for the Venice Pavilion um, and this was a competition run by Ronnie D'Astasio from D'Astasio Restaurant who was a, is a huge was a huge supporter and um, trying to promote the whole idea of the the Cox building being replaced and now of course it has been and there was an official invited competition and I think there were a few gripes in the architectural community that that should have been an open competition but anyway it was an invited competition and, and the DCM building sits there now um, my proposal was a, a ribbed steel structure which um, I wanted to read like a terrain um, with a bridge that actually cut through the canal 
and angled around a fire pit that when the whole gallery was open and in use, this fire would be burning the whole time and people would stand around it as a sort of gathering space. Um, in term, as an acknowledgement of the important, you know, the sort of cultural Barbie and also that Indigenous element as well, the importance of, um, well, fire as the gathering space and that primal element as well. Um, I also did a submission for the, for the Flinders Street Station competition, um, which I think it's a big undertaking for a small office like mine um, and um, probably a costly one as well. But in terms of how comp competitions provide an opportunity to, to really explore ideas, um, I think they're an important thing in a practice. So my competition entry was um, looking at how uh, to bring back landscape into that space and it was called Station Park um, and it was a, basically a grid shell structure that unified the whole site. Um, uh, yeah, with sort of landscaped park elements within and also a real importance of connecting with the river and sort of, yeah, reconnecting that site with the river, which lacks so much at the moment. Uh, another aspect of my practice, um, I like to get involved in, in in things beyond, well, that are about architecture, but also about other disciplines as well. And um, a couple of years ago, there was an opportunity to get involved with the Melbourne Architecture Annual, which is um, um, was basically an opportunity to propose something. And myself and some colleagues proposed um, a film and architecture program for Melbourne Architecture Annual, which we called Cinescapes. Um, and we ran, there's a, a Melbourne City Council organisation down on the river called Signal for, for Youth. And uh, we ran a, a program with them, a film and architecture program with them. Um, and their work was then projected up on the screens of Signal at the end of that program. Uh, we did a projection under Princess Bridge for one night that included a soundscape and we ran a program about film and architecture through ACME. Um, also the work that the, the student, the teenagers did um, at Signal was projected on Fed Square during the week as well. So um, that was an opportunity to, I mean, I've always had a, an interest in film and architecture anyway. Um, when I was studying at RMIT, there was a, a woman called Antonia Bruns who has since passed away and there's actually a, a student award in her name these days for students whose, whose work is about film and architecture um, or has some, some relationship to film. So these are some of the images of, um, of the bridge project and um, it basically, it was projecting images and highlighting the structure for one night only. That's what, we could only get the funding for one night. This fantastic um, media group, MediaTek, uh, provided the staff and the equipment uh, for, for, the, for the, the projection that night. But we have filmed it. You can actually see it on YouTube if you look it up through my website. So in terms of my own work, um, look, I've had my practice for seven years now, um, which is still, it's still a young practice, I guess. And um, my work's predominantly residential and it's predominantly in the inner city of Melbourne. So I'm dealing with that, with that inner city urban fabric. And in a way, a lot of my projects are urban infill projects. Um, and I... I do draw a lot of inspiration from, from these sites that I'm actually working with. Um, 
and the scale of my work is quite small in terms of budget and size. But but you know I'm I'm, I'm finding that an interesting area to be working in. So I've, I'll run through the projects and then I'll, I'll look at two in detail. Um, this is a project in Brunswick which was an extension to a, um, a, a suburban house that basically inhabited what was a driveway. So I extended out into the driveway and inhabited the driveway and created, sort of reoriented the whole organisation of the house and the entry was then created through what was a former former driveway. Um, the form was generated through necessity of actually getting light into the space as well as a reference to the sort of light industrial area as well. Um, and these are all sort of, as the practice is building up, sort of small projects that I've worked on. Um, that one to the right is called Extrusion House and again that was providing more space for these, for the clients. Um, but again it was an opportunity to sort of play with the sort of the typical Victorian house form and, and think about accentuating that rather than providing something in complete contrast to the outside of it, actually accentuating that form and then it becoming an actual um, outdoor pergola area at the rear. Um, and the one on the other side, uh, which um, was for a, a wheelchair bound um, client actually. So it was about being able to get visual access into the garden and physical access into the garden at her home which she hadn't previously been able to have but to actually be able to connect visually with, with it from where it, wherever she was inside her home. Um, the one on the bottom is called Catherine's Veranda and and this project, the client came to me and said they wanted, you know, all these new rooms added to the back of the house. But in actual fact, the home itself was ample in terms of its size and I convinced her to just put a veranda, which was formerly there but had been completely boxed in and was rotting away. So we actually brought the veranda back to the home in, in a in a way like an outdoor room and quite sculptural and I just reorganised the inside of the home and actually saved her a lot of money um, but I was interested in a reinterpretation of the Australian veranda. Um, and these are some other, that, that's uh, on the right is a house in Apollo Bay which has since weathered as I'd hoped in terms of the silver top ash silvering off beautifully and it's a very robust tough building. I wanted it to read almost like a sort of bunker like the, the coastal bunkers that you see and, um, and it has weathered in that way and the owners actually live upstairs so all the living areas are upstairs so they engage completely with the ocean and the views um, and it's quite a different building to the typical buildings that you see in Apollo Bay. Um, the bridge houses, so these are, are two projects which explore the courtyard pavilion typology which I actually use a fair bit in my work and um, Bridge House One is my own house and that was built on a very tight budget and I actually built that owner builder when my second child was a baby so why not build a house when you've got a baby and um, and then that, that house has then influenced quite a few other projects since in terms of um, realising for a family how well it works, how well it functions in terms of um, I actually worked out of this house. I've got my own office now in, in North Melbourne, but 
for many years I worked from the study at the rear pavilion that was um, purpose designed for that for that function um, and you physically have to cross the bridge to get to that space and it was very much yep yeah, that's a no kid zone it zoned the house well in terms of, of our needs and I actually adopted that same strategy for Bridge House 2 which was a new house um, so these are some images of Bridge House 1. Now the, these, these are quite old, these photos. The garden's actually grown and been developed further now. Um, so I should probably get it re-photographed. But again, in terms of using um, off-the-shelf materials and thinking about different ways to use them, and you know, it's a very tight budget. So it had to be, it had to be easy to build, um, easy for a carpenter, used to building pretty straightforward forward buildings um, and robust for two young boys to inhabit. And we also found materials as well, like that um, industrial window we found in a laneway and had it refurbished and, and it works quite nicely as a south-facing screen element to, that, to the bridge. Um, and connections to the courtyards, which act as um, extensions of those internal spaces, were very important. So I'm going to talk in more detail about two, two projects. Um, and this is Bridge House 2. So this was for a, a family in Brunswick. West Brunswick's um, a rapidly gentrifying neighbourhood in Melbourne and um, a great source of work for a lot of architects in Melbourne as well. And so I, I've done quite a few projects in Brunswick. So this was on a busy road in Brunswick and um, it's quite a, quite a diverse building types in terms of there is some light industrial there still. There's the classic brick suburban homes and, um, and there's still um, in this particular street, there's still a lot of a lot of shops, including this lovely pink building right next to my site. So, um, so it presents quite an ambiguous sculptural facade to the street, and um, and the form, well, it has been informed by the fabric of the of the area completely in terms of. Um, taking advantage of the fact that right next door is a shop front with no setback. So that was a great opportunity for me to actually propose a studio right on the street. And although fighting for that we ended up in VCAT, um, we actually successfully won because it's very clear that this is a broad range of type typologies in this street. And, and so that was a battle that was won well. Um, oh, that's a bit of photographic trickery. So. Also, what was important to this building was um, taking advantage of, of buildings that were built right to the, to the boundaries around it as well and taking advantage of that to actually use that to build to the boundary. So this client had actually come to me having already had a house designed for her um, that she decided not to go with, that was just the typical plonk, the building in the middle of the site, um, garage to the boundary, one metre off to the side, and I think they gave her three metres at the back. And she really wasn't happy with that, and she also wanted a private home. She didn't want windows on the front busy street. So I really responded to that in terms of internalising the spaces and actually creating a series of courtyards. So the living spaces looked into internal spaces and the front facade was quite a blind side, quite a blind facade to the street. So you can see how the buildings sat around the site. Mm. So in terms of precedence for this project and actually a lot of my projects, um, there's the McGlashan and Everest Reed House which utilises the, the pavilion courtyard typology and that was actually a beach house 
so I've 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 taken that that typology and thought about it and actually applied it to an inner urban infill condition. Um, I guess I've looked at um, examples of low cost housing types that demonstrate efficient use of space uh, materials and construction methods, and so included in that is also um, Graham Guns. Molesworth Street townhouses and an earlier early example in LA which I did visit when I was living there as well in terms of um, the Mar Vista housing tract which again was very efficient use of space and construction materials and methods as well. So I guess that's a challenge with some of my projects is how to how to achieve um, spatially intriguing spaces on tight budgets and um, I think that's a, that those challenges can actually result in, in just in some really interesting architecture. So this is the layout of the house. It's basically a studio at the front, a very um, ambiguous blind facade to the street. Um, we made the, the the garden on the street indigenous planting and the the entry is actually hidden from the street so you enter into a, a protected entryway and there is quite a formal entry and then you enter into the main living space. So again I guess it's challenging, um, it's going back to thinking about smaller homes, this is under 200 square metres and um, I think that this could be used as um, a good prototype for a under 200 square metres affordable home. Um, and thankfully this client was really willing to, to think about um, her home in this way and, and was quite happy to, to embrace this. Uh, so the, the, the living areas for herself and her daughters were right at the rear of the building, um, accessed via a bridge through two courtyards, and the main living areas and guest spaces in the, in the central area, and then the studio right on the street. So that's a bit of a construction drawing. So that the sections are help you understand the sort of organisation of the program in the building a bit better. Very simple palette, kept the palette to an absolute minimum um, and it was important to give in this project what was most important was that each, each space had a view into a garden area uh, for passive ventilation, heating and cooling. So it actually performed really well. Um, it performs very well thermally also. So the use of materials helps sort of curate and define the spaces as well. The main living area was um, a locally manufactured brick was used from Kraus Big Bricks in Bendigo. Um, and that defines the main living areas where internally you read that external form. And again, there's, there's function to that form. It's actually um, letting in north light. It's not a terribly well oriented site, so getting north light into that main living space. Um, those upper windows provide that um, and all the views are oriented to these courtyards. And, you know, the fabric of the neighbourhood celebrated. It's, it's, you know, you get glimpses of, of it. I've used elements of that in the, in the materiality of the building itself. And people actually comment that it feels so big and spacious. So that was a, I think the fact that there are these extended sight lines created through the, through the home that sort of provide that. Whew. 
Um, and another element which is important to my work is how the building uh, reads at night as well, so the night architecture element. And this playing also with the idea of, of, of the um, mixed use in the street evident in terms of there being shop fronts and things, the, the studio plays with that as well. So at night time that facade is illuminated which, which gives back to the street. I think there's a real street activation occurring through that as well. So the, the next project I'll show you is called, it's called the Rhythm House. It's a bit more playful, but again in Brunswick. And this was a family of musicians. So we actually needed to get um, Marshall Day engineers involved in this. And it was quite a unique brief. They actually wanted a home that could also be a performance space and a recording space. So they could actually utilise the living spaces to perform. And... Um, yeah, each child is literally a prodigy musician. That's amazing. And all their friends have come over and, and perform in this home. So this, this was an interesting one in that um, it's in a, a heritage precinct. So there are all these California bungalows that look the same. They initially came to me thinking that they'd like to knock the building down and do something new. Um, but we weren't allowed to do that. And I mean, I respect that. There was a a streetscape element that, that, that had to be sort of carefully thought about. So, um, so we worked with keeping the existing house and um, there was quite a fall in the site and a big garage, existing garage on a laneway. So some really fantastic site conditions in terms of, you know, what could be used to develop something new for these, this family. Um, and also the fact that it was a corner site and it had this wonderful street frontage I felt was an opportunity to do something that would really take advantage and engage with the street. So we also, um, I mean there are some quite playful musical references with this home as well and an opportunity to think about repetition and think about repetition and different elements of music and how you might think about that in terms of an architecture, in terms of a, a facade. Um, I looked to Des Brownier and his sort of, the sort of movement and activation of the facades in his work. And there was also an element carrying through from the extrusion house and working with this material, which was the laminated timber portal frames. So the existing house was timber and um, it made sense in terms of it also requiring some serious acoustic engineering to, to stick with timber as a material. So that's the site condition. We took advantage of, of the garage at the back and actually made that a two-storey garage and took advantage again of these, this, the fact that there were already walls on the boundary. So in a way it almost created a sort of terrain down the street internally and, and externally sort of reading like a, a series of buildings. And the old and new were quite clearly defined. So the portal frames were really deep. They were sort of um, three, about 300 deep. And that allowed us to do basically the acoustic requirement of having two double studs um, and all of the additional plasterboard and everything. I mean, basically, this family needed to be able to perform and record in this space and not disturb neighbours. So it did require, require some serious acoustic engineering. So I had to think about a system that would, that would manage that um, without being outrageously expensive, but could also, would also enhance the acoustic requirements of the space. So the timber portal frame um, seemed like the most logic. Well, it, it, it lent itself to meeting those requirements. And this is a street facade. So you can see that it's a series of the rooms reading almost like a series of buildings down the streetscape. And there was also the need to still be able to enter it 
the garage to offload all of the musical instruments. So, and that has a studio above. So we worked with the engineer and the acoustic engineer to come up with a system. We um, basically a series of portal frames and that were all at different heights. So that allowed for that sort of faceted surface that was required in terms of acoustics, but also meant it went up pretty quickly and efficiently, almost like Meccano. And we worked on a, a construction system for these portal frames to go together that was quite neatly resolved, so it wasn't really a heavy expressed detail. Um, so that's the portal frames going up and it was really important that they're expressed internally. Um, so it has, it literally has a sort of very rhythmic musical feel about it, but it also has a, a function of providing that acoustic engineering element, it, it performing well acoustically. So the, it, it basically is a performance and living space. And um, uh, in terms of, I mean, thermally it performs well as well, even though it's west facing to the long facade, there's um, the portal frames go externally to actually provide shading, and the windows can be open for east west ventilation. Um, and the idea was that these rooms, people could just sit anywhere, sit on the steps, like the audience, and can spill out into outdoor areas as well and that's up in the up in the studio looking back over the house and again there's any a sort of I guess well that that's a bit of a playful nod to um, the Brunswick cricket team which are a black and white and a bit of a musical reference and that's the family Um, so in terms of what's happening in the office at the moment, um, there's at the far left, um, I think these are, I think more and more practices are finding these, these sort of briefs uh, happening in, in their offices where families are coming. This in particular is a multi-generational home, so these clients want their parents, well, the, the um, wants her parents to be able to live with them. So I'm developing a, a design for them that is basically a, a self-contained unit at the back of the home, but also again utilising the idea of the courtyard and providing a communal space between the two homes. So there's actually a protected communal space where the parents and the, the daughter and her partner can actually gather in a communal area as well. Um, the parents have a completely separate entry, but the garden and this protected deck area act as a sort of communal congregation area. Um, and again, all of the, the spaces look into this, this courtyard area. Another project is a, is a family home where we're think designing at the front of the home uh, an independent unit that they're wanting to rent either through Airbnb or rent out to whomever um, as a means of generating income. So I think, you know, all of these briefs are coming about as a result of, of I guess, the housing challenges that are facing Melbourne at the moment or facing Australia in terms of the cost of housing and people are thinking about ways of how they can challenge that. So. Um, It's, it's interesting that I'm actually getting clients come to me with these briefs now and um, I think these could almost be developed as, as sort of typologies of how to sort of deal with some of these issues facing, facing us with housing. And the last one is, the, is a townhouse project and that's an opportunity for me to explore. Um, I'm looking at an insulated precast panel system and looking at how this can be constructed very efficiently in terms of um, using this material. And also the plan is um, 
it's a mirrored plan, so there's an element of that to the um, to this hopefully structural efficiency as well. So there's some of the projects that are currently happening in the office at the moment. That's a view of the multi-generational home. So you can see the, the protected um, community deck area between the parents and the custom house. Um, and, you know, this could almost be developed as an, as an element that could be plonked into anyone's back, back garden, I guess, in terms of providing that opportunity. And that's a view from one of the precast townhouses. Again, the courtyard playing still a very important role in my work. And there's a double height space within this as well um, over the central family area. Um, I'm also attempting to do a PhD and I don't know if I'm juggling my time very successfully, but I guess um, I am interested in these, this issue in terms of the fringe of what's happening in our cities. This is a picture of Sunbury on the fringe. And it's even interesting driving out here today in terms of that delineation between leaving the old suburbs, hitting the new sprawl, and it's so fucking homogenous. And um, I think it's a real problem and I think it's something architects need to be dealing with. So I'm hoping through the work I'm doing in my real work, I'm tackling some of these projects that can be applied to these areas to get us thinking about these problems in a different way. And I think architects very much need to be dealing with this sort of thing. Um, it's completely builder-developer driven and there's no architect involvement in this stuff at all. And yet that is the new housing that's happening predominantly in Australia. So um, how to tackle that through my practice is something I'm sort of dealing with in my research. And to end on a, another competition, the NGV Pavilion, this was my submission. I didn't get shortlisted, but anyway. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's still exploring themes that I'm really interested in my own work. And um, I worked with a, an artist and in a landscape designer, landscape architect on this project. And um, it explores the ideas of the temporal and also ideas about um, the landscape that was there prior to colonisation. So what this project proposes to do is actually to bring an Indigenous landscape back into this space that may have been there prior to colonisation so that there's that educational element and experiential element to it. Um, and I actually used a strong existing element within the site to actually um, orient and site my pavilion, uh, which is the bluestone seat from which, yeah, my pavilion very much sits in relation to that. Um, and the perforations in the thin steel, I mean, it's sort of very much referring to the idea of a, temp a temporal transient structure and the poles are um, shugi shuban, like the, the charred timber poles. And the idea is it can be installed with very little impact to the site. So um, uh, screw piled into the grass areas and then on a steel grid system. So providing a, a steel sleeve that then the poles can go into and the landscape runs through and then there's a deck and basically a thin steel canopy which I wanted it to read almost like fabric and the perforations from that were generated from um, the artist artwork seen above. Thank you. <laughs>